knows what we need even before we ask him, but he's faithful to meet us where we're at, isn't he? Well, if you got your Bibles this morning, we had turned to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 17. We've been in a series on the book of 1 Peter, but we're going to take a break this week to look at Luke chapter 17. I've told you before about the two men that were walking through a field one day, two friends, and they noticed that there was an enraged bull in this field. So they took off for their lives, realizing that they were in for trouble, and they took off for the nearest fence, hoping to get over the fence in time. But the storming bull followed in hot pursuit, and soon it became apparent they weren't going to make it over the fence in time. So terrified, the one shouted to the other, to his friend, put up a prayer, John, we're in for it. And John answered, I can't, I've never made a public prayer in my life, I don't even know what to say. But you must, implored the companion. The bull is catching up to us. All right, panted John. I'll say the only prayer I know, the one my father used to pray at the table. Oh, Lord, for what we're about to receive, make us truly thankful. (laughs) Maybe the right prayer for the right situation. I don't know. We're going to talk about thankfulness this morning from Luke chapter 17. I want to tell you this morning, I've got really good news for you. I know God's will for your life. I want to tell you that this morning. I can tell you on the authority of God's word that I know God's will for you. Everybody excited to hear it? You ready? Anybody wondering what God's will is for you? Here it is, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you you. God's will is that we would learn to give thanks in all circumstances. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say give thanks once a year as you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table overeating before you go Black Friday shopping. It doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say give thanks when all is well. What's it say? Give thanks when? In all Circumstances. So as we approach Thanksgiving this week, I want to talk about thankfulness. I've titled the message, Thanks Living, Living a Lifestyle of Thankfulness. And that's the type of person that I want to be known as. How about you? When people look at your life, do you want to be known as a thankful person? They just say, when I see somebody that's, that has joy despite the circumstance, when I see somebody that has perspective, I think of and they think of you. In fact, Christians have the greatest reason to rejoice and be thankful as we focus on who we are and what we have in Christ. Our joy will increase and our impact on a lost world will be greater as we shine bright for God's glory. I think the more thankful we are, the more attractive the world is going to be to know the reason for the hope that you have. It's easy to be thankful when all is going well, but what about even when things are difficult to have perspective in the midst of that, that it is well with my soul and that God is caring for me? Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, and will you stand with me as the word is read this morning. On the way to Jerusalem, he, Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Lord, I thank you for your word that is truly a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And I ask that through the message this morning that you might do a few things in our lives, Lord. One, that you might 
draw those that don't know the good news of salvation to an understanding of what it means to surrender their life, to be forgiven, to be full of life by your salvation alone. And I pray for those that do know you that we would gain perspective and live thankful lives so that our light might shine even brighter to a dissatisfied world that realizes that they need something to fill the void in their lives. And Lord, we know that is only you. And so Lord, would you prepare our hearts and speak to us through your word today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. I was driving to men's breakfast yesterday morning here at the church, and I noticed a bumper sticker on a car, and it said this, Washington plates, and it said, I jump out of perfectly good planes. Well, they like to parachute, I guess. When Lisbeth and I, uh, many of you know that Lisbeth and I uh, were in Hawaii for a few years as youth pastors. I know it was really tough, but uh, we were there uh, for a couple of years. And while there, uh, we, we were there in 2000 to 2002, and, and while there, Lisbeth and I got to know this uh, couple in the church. They actually helped out with our youth group uh, there that we were youth pastoring. And he was a Marine. And uh, so him and his wife and Lisbeth and I started spending time hanging out with each other. And somehow me and this Marine, we talked about how cool it would be to go skydiving while in Hawaii on the North Shore. I don't know why I was talking about that, to be honest with you. <laughs> because I don't even like to climb a ladder to change these lights. Like, I, I don't know why I was talking. You know when you're just kind of talking about things and, you know, can I tell you right away, don't talk big to a Marine. <laughs> can, can I just warn you, you know, you don't want to talk big to a Marine. I, I was. And it looked like that we weren't going to have a chance to ever jump. Um, in fact, his time was getting closer to leaving. He was going to be stationed elsewhere. And Elizabeth and I were going to come back to the mainland uh, here. And then my friend went to a Marine Corps ball with his wife. And he won <laughs> a skydiving ticket. And he came to me and he said, Jeremy, I know we've wanted to do this together. Uh, really? You know? Uh, yeah, yeah, we did, didn't we? And I want to pay for half of your ticket. You'll pay for the other half, and we'll go together because I got a free ticket. No way out of it, right? <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, think about it, trying to figure out a way out. Very generous of him. So I remember getting to the airfield, and Lisbeth is there, and his wife, uh, my friend's wife is there, and Lisbeth's holding Jonathan. Now, Jonathan's 16 years old today, but he was like six months old then. And I was filling out this form, and it, it, you know, all liability, all responsibility is yours. And I'm filling this out, and Elizabeth's saying, what? <laughs> Just looking at this form, realizing that it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not a low-risk activity anyway, you know, sort of a high-risk activity. Well, here's a, a picture of me and my friend. I think I have it there like those goofy goggles with the... That smile on my face is really a smile of, help me. <laughs> like, what have I gotten into and what am I thinking here in this situation? And we climbed into the plane with a bunch of other guys and it was a tandem jump. So we were attached to instructors and, and a tandem jump. And I happened to, I guess, somehow get the lead instructor because he was bossing everybody around and what would happen and he decided that him and I were going to jump last. Now, I like to go first if it's something I don't want to do. Like, remember this in class, you've got to give a speech or do something, just get it done with. Well, he decides we're going to go last. And so we're, we're, we're getting to altitude and before the other guys start going, and your mind starts, starts wondering, right? And you think, what if the shoot doesn't deploy? What if it gets tangled? What if my jumping partner is suicidal? <laughs> what, if these, what if I'm really not attached to him very well and I'm going to go off one way and he's, you know, he's, he's going to be fine, but I'm not? 
And I began to think about these things, and finally it came to the point where everybody else had jumped, and the pilot was in the plane. You know, you're thinking, what would my friend do if I just landed, if we just said, you know, we're not, <laughs> I'm not going to jump. So it finally comes to our turn, and we're at the door, and for whatever reason, he wanted to look out the door for an inordinate amount of time. <laughs> Remember, I don't like heights, but we're sitting there looking out the door. And I know he's waiting for people to, you know, and seeing everything that's taking place under him. But I can tell you, I, you know the feeling of thankfulness you have when the chute deployed? Okay, we slowed down. And then when your feet touch the ground... <laughs> Boy, that was a great, great, great feeling. <laughs> feeling of thankfulness. A feeling of like you've got a new lease on life. In fact, I have a picture after the skydive with our certificates, I think. <laughs> this is a look of... <laughs> I just like, like live 10 years in 10 minutes and <laughs> I'm like really thankful to have a new day, and I'm going to hug my wife and hold my kid. Have you ever gone through something in life that was terrifying or something in life like a near, near wreck, or maybe it was a wreck and could have been life-threatening? Maybe it was a surgery, and you went in and you, the, the doctor said, you know, there's not much hope. Um, we heard a story of that this morning, in fact. The doctor said, there's not much hope, and you survive and you wake up and you have this new lease on life, you're like thankful for everything, thankful for a new breath, Thank you, thankful for a new day, thankful for new opportunities. Well, we're going to meet 10 men that get a new lease on life in our text. But we're going to see that only one properly understands the importance of coming to Jesus' feet, where true life is found. Not just enjoying the gifts, but knowing the giver of those gifts, the Creator our Savior, our King. So we read this in our text. On the way to Jerusalem, uh, we'll go verse by, through a few verses at a time. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The term for lepers here can be used for a variety of skin diseases, and it's something we read about quite a bit in the New Testament, quite a bit in the Bible, in fact. And I think when we think of, of these ten lepers, I think it's probably help for us, helpful for us this morning to recognize there's always somebody that has it worse. And I don't mean to minimize what you're going through. Maybe somebody in here is facing something that is is incredibly horrible, and I understand that. But I just want to help us with some perspective this morning, that as we read about these ten men, they, they wouldn't have been able to spend time with their wife. They wouldn't have been able to hold their wife. They wouldn't have been able to spend time close to their children. They wouldn't have been able to eat around a table with family for the holidays, for a meal. In fact, they had to stay a distance from everybody and shout out, unclean, unclean. They would have felt like outcast in society. And I, I think when we read about this, it just, maybe for a moment this morning, can you just say thanks to God if you have the opportunity to sit with family? Maybe not everybody's going to even be around the table this year. And that's a difficult thing. Somebody's maybe gone on. Somebody's graduated on to heaven. But you'll be with others that you love. And you can say thank you, Lord, for that. Or maybe you don't have perfect health this morning, but you've got better health than you used to have. And you just want to say, thank you, God, you've been so good to me. I think perspective is helpful, isn't it? Hasn't God been good to us? You say, life has been tough, but God has been there every step of the way with me through it. I did some research on leprosy some years ago when I was reading a book, and the author states this about leprosy. He says, it's the oldest recorded disease and one of the most feared. For centuries, the leprosy victims had to call out, unclean, unclean, whenever somebody approached. Leprosy is indeed cruel, but not in the manner of most diseases. Primarily, it works like an anesthetic, attacking the pain cells of hands and feet and nose and ears and eyes to produce numbness. 
Not so bad, really, one might think. Most diseases are feared because of their pain. What makes a painless disease so horrible, you ask? Yet leprosy's numbing quality is precisely the reason for the fabled destruction of tissue. For thousands of years, people thought the disease itself caused the ulcers on hands and feet and face that so often led to infection and ultimately loss of limb. Dr. Brand's pioneering research in India established that in virtually all cases, leprosy only numbs the extremities. Tissue damage results solely because the warning system of pain has fallen silent. It's a scary disease, isn't it? You realize that pain is sometimes a good thing? Pain is warning you there's an issue, there's a problem that needs to be taken care of. Sometimes pain is out of control, but are you thankful to know that? You ever went hiking before? And as you're hiking along, you feel a rock in your shoe. Ever had that feeling? And you can't take your shoe off because of wherever you're at. You can't stop. And as you continue to walk, no longer do you think you've got a pebble in your shoe, but you think you've got glass. But it's somehow gotten into your shoe and your foot is just aching with every step. And then before you know it in your mind, it's a boulder with sharp, jagged edges. It's got to be in your shoe. You don't even know how it fits in there. It hurts so bad. And you finally get to a place where you can take your shoes off and you shake out what you think has got to be this massive boulder of a huge, sharp object, and this little pebble falls out onto your hand, almost microscopic. You're like, this is the culprit? This is what was causing all... But you see, we feel pain. We don't have that numbness of our, of, 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 of our feet or hands. We would feel that pain and take it out. A leper wouldn't feel that. It would, might create a sore. Heard about a leper that went to reach for a potato that had fallen into a fire. And whereas most of us would have recoiled from the, from the heat and only, only been slightly hurt, didn't feel it. And the damage it caused to his hand as he reached in to grab this potato. We can understand that these ten lepers must have felt ugly. Because very likely they were missing parts of their nose perhaps, parts of their body. I think that one of the coolest parts of this miracle is not just that they're healed, but can you imagine fingers growing back? You're like going to the priest, and on the way, your nose. On the way, all of a sudden, you know, your ear of it you'd lost, all of a sudden, it's back. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? Four things I want you to see from this text. Number one is this. The ten lepers sought Jesus for supernatural healing. I said at the beginning that, that my desire is that we would learn to be thankful in all circumstances. But can I tell you that thankfulness doesn't mean that you don't recognize that life is difficult and that God cares about what you're going through. So I'm not saying let's be thankful and pretend that life is rosy when it's not. And everybody say they understand what I'm saying here? So I am telling you if life is difficult, you've got a Savior that cares. And I just want to tell you the proper place to go to cry out to Him, would you help me? Would you meet me? Whether it's using a medical professional, God, or whether it's using a counselor, however you want to help me, God, I trust you're the one that will heal. Or if it's a supernatural healing, would you bring that to my life, Lord? I wonder if you've come to that point. Anybody have a need this morning? Maybe we could just ask God, Lord, I want to be thankful in all circumstances, but I think it's also proper that I ask you for your help because you care. And so, Lord, would you heal me today? I believe by faith that you can heal me. And church, I want to say that I firmly believe this to be true. I believe right now, November of 2017, that God can instantaneously heal something that you, you haven't found hope for in the last 10 years. Say, Lord, I ask. 
Lord, would you have mercy on me? Second thing we notice is this. The ten lepers don't plead for justice, they plead for mercy. There's like a huge difference between justice and mercy, isn't there? Justice is getting what you deserve, right? Like it's fairness. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. So the lepers are not like, Jesus, show me justice. Somehow in America, we live in this entitled society where everybody thinks they're entitled to everything. The lepers weren't like that. They weren't entitled. They, they didn't say, Jesus, show me justice. They said, Jesus, we need your compassion and mercy. And I just want to remind you, when you understand that he didn't need to do that for you, but he did by his grace, it makes us so much more thankful. When you walk around feeling like you somehow deserve it, and he meets you, it's just like an expectation then. It's justice. It's, it's justice. But when you recognize his grace and mercy toward you, like these lepers, I think there's this joy that should abound in our lives. They don't offer Jesus anything because they probably don't have anything that you could possibly offer somebody that were to heal you. Number three is this. While all were healed, there's four things I want to share from this text. While all were healed, only one came back to give thanks, and he was, what was he? So while all were healed, only one came back to give thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Luke 17, 15 to 18. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan, and then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? I want you to listen to Jesus' question here. Where are, the, where are the nine? So Jesus' question here implies that he expects they all should have returned to give thanks. Did you catch that? We're not ten cleansed? Where, where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this This foreigner? Only one came back. And the one you wouldn't expect to come back, the one you wouldn't expect to be worshiping the Jewish rabbi and saying, who is this that could do such things? The others had the word, and they, they, there wasn't a corruption of the word like the Samaritans had, but the others had the word and, and should have realized and recognized, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the promised one? that is to come. Now, I don't blame them hugely that they didn't want to run right back to Jesus because where would you go if you had some disease where you could not spend any time with your family and all of a sudden you've been miraculously healed? Where would you want to go? Like, okay, I need to go see the priest because that's what the law says, but then I'm going home. Right? I'm going to go see my family. I'm going to hold my kids. I'm going to hug my wife. In some ways, I don't blame them, but I think the danger is this. And I think this is the same danger for every one of us in this place. That God meets us in some way, right? And He, and he, and he blesses us. So we go over here and we, we enjoy the gift that God has given us. And we lose sight of the very one that's given us the gift. And instead of going over here and saying, Jesus, thank you, and I worship you, and I, I recognize it all comes from you, therefore I have proper perspective in how to appreciate the gift, we run over to the gift and we lose sight of the giver of the gift. Isn't this true? And so all of a sudden we're worshiping our grandkids. No grandparent says they worship their grandkids, but you can tell a lot, right? <laughs> By how we can be sometimes, right? As parents, as grandparents... Is this not true? Where does our time, where does our resource, where does, where does our energies go? Where is our focus all the time? Oh, you want to see my grandkid? <laughs> Let me show you my 485 pictures. Do you got time? <laughs> and I'm not even saying that we shouldn't enjoy God's gifts. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying, though, is isn't it like us to run and enjoy the gifts so much 
that we lose sight of the very one that has given the gifts and we fail to run over and bow at his feet and say, God, you are so good to me. And I just want to teach this church, we have so much to be thankful for. Let's learn to say, God, you have been so good to me. Life may not be perfect, but isn't he gracious to place us in the U.S.? To place us in this beautiful state? Aren't you thankful for his goodness and grace? Aren't you thankful for a church family? I am so thankful. So many gifts that God has given us. I wonder if it's an accurate assessment that we go back and return to give thanks one out of ten times. Tell me if this has happened to you. You're trying to figure out something, and you're, you're, you're just stressed over it, and you pray, and all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and you got the idea. Does this ever happen? I can't tell you how many times, like, all of a sudden, clarity has come to a situation or an idea has come. And then we forget that it was God that gave us that idea, right? And I wonder how often we lose sight of just saying, God, you are so good to me thousands of times every day. Isn't he good? He is so full of grace and life. Warren Wearsby said this, God isn't in a hurry. Is that a word somebody needs this morning? The Israelites in the wilderness got accustomed to their blessings and God had to chasten the people. Numbers 11. God had fed the nation with heavenly manna each morning and yet the people were getting tired of it. But now our whole being is dried up. Does that sound like your kids? There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. I was a few weeks ago, I was teasing my kids, or I was saying something in a sermon, and Elizabeth goes, our kids aren't like that. <laughs> so whenever I tease my kids, they, I've, we've got wonderful kids. I knew of a minister, but actually he would use his kids in illustrations, and he started paying them five bucks anytime he used them as an illustration, because, <laughs> you know, minister's kids, right? They, they, they become part of the illustrations. Nothing but manna, Wearsby writes. They were experiencing a miracle of God's provision every morning, yet they were no longer excited about it. Nothing but manna. One of the evidences, listen to this, this is important that we get this before Thanksgiving this year. One of the evidences that we have grown accustomed to our blessings is, is the spirit of criticism and complaining. Instead of thanking God for what we have, we complain about it, and tell him we wish we had something else. You can be sure that if God did give us what we asked for, we would eventually complain about that too. The person who's got accustomed to his blessings can never be satisfied. And so I just want to ask you, have you got accustomed to your blessings? Another evidence of this malady is the idea that others have a better situation than we do. The Israelites remember their diet in Egypt and longed to return to the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. They were saying, the people in Egypt are so much better off than we are. You're thinking, what? Like, don't you remember throwing your kids in the river? Do you remember the whips? Do you remember all of the... Obviously, he writes, they had forgotten the slavery they had endured in Egypt and the terrible bondage from which God had delivered them. Slavery is a high price to pay for a change in diet. God has been so good to us. And even if you've lost a job because of your integrity and your faith, God has been so good to us, hasn't he? He calls us by name and he has set us free out of slavery as he did the Israelites out of their physical slavery, but he set us free out of sin and destruction and death. Elizabeth, you want to come forward this morning? Fourth and finally, many are like the nine lepers healed from a distance. 
but failing to experience the full blessing of falling at the feet of Christ. And I think this is where the rubber meets the road for some in here this morning. Notice they called to Jesus from a distance. Jesus, have mercy on us. And really, that's what they should have done. They could only do that because they were lepers. They shouldn't come in contact. But they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. But as soon as Jesus touched them and they were healed, as soon as he, he said, You're, go, and, and they went to the priest, they didn't return to give him thanks. But one did, and notice what happens. And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. It's made you whole. This word can even be translated, your faith has saved you. I think the emphasis is not that he was the only one healed. They were all healed. I think the emphasis of this is that when he came back, he was recognizing something special about Jesus, that Jesus was not just a teacher, not just a rabbi. And as he bowed on his knees, he's recognizing his need and showing thanks to Jesus. And I just wonder, are there some in this room that have experienced the blessing of Jesus from the outside, a distance, but you've never really encountered him and come to him that he might not just heal you physically, but he might set you free, that he might cleanse you of sin. Last week, six people said, we believe, we need Jesus. We believe he came and he died for us, that we might have life. We trust in him, we turn to him. I have walked with people through all sorts of things. I've walked with people through marriage problems, and I've seen God restore a marriage and yet the people stay over here and join the blessing of God instead of remembering, look at what Jesus has done and coming to the feet of Him for real life, for real salvation. Not just enjoying the outside benefits of being around God's people, of God giving you something that you need in your life, but recognizing that salvation is found in no other name. There is no other name by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. There's a difference between the peripheral blessing that you might experience and the proximity of coming to Him and knowing the very one that not only gives you life, but desires to give you everlasting life. You see, the ten lepers had something far worse than leprosy, didn't they? The Bible says it like this, for the wages of sin is death. Leprosy would eventually lead to physical death, right? You might lose limbs and, and maybe even eventually your life. It eats you from the outside in. But sin is destroying you from the inside out. And that we would come to Him and we would say, Lord, I thank You for all the blessings in my life, for all the ways You've touched me. But Lord, I need you. I, I want to bow at your knees, bow at your feet, come before you on my knees before you for grace. The Bible says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, but a gift from God, not by, the, not by works so that no one may boast. Isaiah the prophet said, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. So my challenge as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning is twofold. One, if you really don't know him, Jesus says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And they'll name all these things they've done for him. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And my question is, do you know him or are you known by him? Have you come to him and said, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me. Lord, I want to follow you. I turn from those things and I turn to you. Then, then do so this morning.
And the second challenge is this, that we would learn not to worship the gifts, but to allow those gifts to drive us to the feet of Jesus where we thank Him, the giver and author of life. Howard Hendricks tells about a time he was in India and he was speaking at a, a leprosorium and there were about 35 or 40 lepers there. They were gathered on a Sunday afternoon in a little chapel. They were in various stages of leprosy. Some had advanced and some weren't as advanced. And he said, before I got up to preach, the guy conducting the meeting asked for praise reports, testimonies. He said the various lepers began to stand and give praise to God. And finally, a little lady in the third row, he says this. He says, I think she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. It says, not in the Hollywood standards of beautiful, but I think she was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. He said she rose to her feet and she held both her hands in the air. All ten fingers were gone. She said this, thank God I'm a leper because through my leprosy I came to know Jesus Christ and I'd rather be a leper and know him than be completely whole and a stranger to His grace. If life is treating you a little bit difficult and it drove you to His feet, it was well worth it. Because church, this life is like, like a mist or vapor. We're here one day and we don't know how long we will be here. Eternity is forever. Can you say it as well with my soul?